Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a special treat for you guys this week. I think a lot of you will know who this guest is, of course. He is the five-time U.S. champion, 2007 FIDE World Cup winner, 1996 FIDE World Championship challenger, many, many other chess accolades, and, of course, of uh, most interest today, he is an author of the brand-new book, Gadakomsky, Chess Gamer, Volume 1, The Awakening. Gadakomsky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, man. Hello, everybody. It's uh, nice to be here. So this is quite an honor for me. I'm super excited to talk to you. And I got your book just in time. Got a, I want to give a shout out to U.S. Chess Sales. I had I had the book rushed to me and uh, was able to, to tear through it in anticipation of this this interview. And it's it's amazing. It's great. I mean, it's the chess itself is incredible. And you've got uh, little memories from your career sprinkled in throughout. Um, how, what was the process like uh, of writing this book, Gata? Did it Was it stuff that you reflect on a lot, or did it sort of bring up a lot of uh, old memories that you hadn't thought of for a while? Well, the idea of writing the book uh, came to me um, back in 2015 or 14, and uh, you know, but uh, I I kept postponing the project because uh, there were a lot of uh, chess uh, things involved. Still, I played some tournaments, but not at the highest level, of course. And uh, I felt that uh, since my Gaming days at the chess stop, they were basically over. You know, I'm 45 now, and these kids, they're all playing chess at the top. Uh, there are only uh, several players of my age who still play there, it's like Tapalov, Anand, and uh, uh, Kramnik just recently retired, and he was a year younger. Yeah, so, um, so I felt that it was probably time to share my knowledge, you know, with the youngsters, some of my experiences, uh, trying to maybe teach them a thing or two about uh, how this whole thing uh, started. Because uh, chess is a very individual sport, and um, for each player, each talent, each hopeful for the World Championship title, you know, the the, the way is uh, completely different. What works for Bobby Fischer, for example, doesn't work for, uh, you know, Boris Paskin, etc., etc. You know, each came to the top uh, via his own path which he had to choose. So uh, I felt it was time for me to write the book, but, uh, you know, I started to make some notes, but it didn't really work until I met my uh, current wife. You know, uh, she's a women's chess grandmaster, former junior world champion, Vera Nivolsna, and uh, she was extremely supportive of uh, this project. And finally, uh, after searching briefly for some chess publishers who would be willing to work with me, you know, I, I never wrote anything before, and this was a massive project. And finally, you know... Uh, I approached the guys at the Thinkers Publishing, and they were extremely supportive of me. In fact, uh, working with them, and I'm still working with them on the volume two and uh, possibly three. And these guys are amazing. You know, they help me with all the uh, things outside of the pure chess, you know, with the editing and you know all the all that stuff, and even uh, gave me some advice on the book and a lot of things. You know, originally the book was planned to be in one volume, but um, the, as I was writing it uh, almost every day. For a few hours, sometimes it took me five or six hours. And, uh, you know, the, the more you start writing, the more things come up from the recess of your memory. And a lot of things I have forgotten, you know, they came back to me and I started to include them. So it was, it's not only a book about my chess games. It's not only um, about my experiences at that moment. It's also about um, my life now, reflection on the past uh, since I'm a completely different person now, right? And I'm looking at them, and I'm comparing and evaluating what was there and what is now. And uh, it's extremely, you know, uh, very entertaining and, in a way, process. But it's also learning, uh, self-learning, discovery. So a lot of things are involved, and um, that's how it started. Okay. Well, I've got a few follow-ups, of course. I mean, that was a... A lot of uh, information to digest. I mean, first of all, I just want to say that I'm glad that you ended up with Thinkers Publishing. I mean, of course, I'm friendly with them. Uh, and, you know, Romaine Edward was on the on the show recently. Um, 
talking about his own great book, but um, it's a beautiful book. That's the main thing. And I actually, I often get books uh, either through Forward Chess or on Chessable or even on Kindle, stuff like that. But I'm glad that I got the physical book in this case because it's, um, you know, it's a really high quality book and it's something something to savor. Um, but one thing I was curious about based on what you said was, uh, was it, you made it sound like you went to some publishers and they didn't just immediately make you an offer you couldn't refuse. So did you actually have trouble finding a publisher or did you just have trouble coming to terms? Well, uh, no, the trouble is that I have absolutely no experience in publishing and uh, I wasn't sure which publisher to do, uh, I mean, to, to get. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the problem was uh, it's like how... Um, how we could uh, connect and work together because uh, the book was originally scheduled uh, scheduled for the um, early spring of uh, last year yes and the book came late because i had tournaments and i was moving from siberia to st petersburg and a lot of other things happened so you know uh i was late with my book with my project and the publisher was very very accommodating he was extremely helpful and understanding and uh again it's not a just about the finance terms, about the connection that you have with your publisher. I think that's extremely important to have a great working, uh, communicating uh, relationship, just like in everything else in life, you know. And uh, that was uh, one uh, very important moment that touched with me. And uh, I said uh, to my wife, I said to myself, hey, this is, these are great people and uh, let's work with these guys. So that that's, and uh, the fact that my one book, that I was supposed to write one book, right, it turned out to be so huge that uh, now we're like thinking it has to be two volumes, in fact, and the, at the very least. And you no, know, it's, again, it's it's a fascinating process, and I'm discovering this. Uh, so, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, it's <laughs> it's no surprise to me, and probably to to other people listening, that the a work of your. Uh, a book about your your chess games is going to require more than one volume. And of course, it, it's nice that it has sort of the natural break of the period where you you stopped playing chess so that this volume one covers the games leading up to that period predominantly. And the, the forthcoming volume two will cover uh, the, the subsequent games. And by the way, listeners, before we go any further, I should just mention the book is already available from Thinkers Publishing. Uh, in the United States, it's available at uh, Chess for Less and U.S. Chess Sales. Um, and it, it will be available on Amazon in a couple of weeks, it looks like. So it's it's already out there for you guys to get. And of course, as always, I'll put links to, to where you can where you can acquire this wonderful book. But gotta let's let's get into the meat of the book. Um, so you sit down to write this. You've had this rattling around in your head for a while, and you you know that you're going to write it. Did you start chronologically? I know in the book you begin with when you came to the New York Open in 1989, uh, somewhat legendary tournament um was that where you began uh with your writing as well well i was uh, that's actually the point where i started writing but be, be, because uh, i still had a notable chess career here in the soviet union right and i was thinking whether to include that in the book however that would uh, require me to get those uh, early games you know in the old times when you didn't have computers you had to actually write games on the score sheets right uh -huh. and can can you imagine all those kids uh, <laughs> score sheets that i had to find and to get and that was just simply impossible to do i mean uh, my dad had some copies of that stuff and i had some of that stuff but i threw threw that stuff out because it was so old and some of the experience were actually quite painful to remember so i decided to focus more on the um, uh, side when I came to the yes because it was a clear-cut uh, um, way to write the book, right? Because in the Soviet Union, again, uh, there were quite a few memories, and uh, I still I was a junior Soviet Union champion uh, under 18, to, uh, two times. And I think I mentioned it in my book as well when I uh, make uh, annotations to my game versus Tivikov, uh, but um, I believe that should be in the volume too. So we had some um, discussions with my, with my publisher whether I should include this game, actually, because Stivikov, as we all know, he has been the world traveler, right? right. He, and, and I know this guy since I played him, actually, a key game, the last round of the junior championship, which I won. And that game sort of uh, make made a big, uh, um, big uh, decision on the outcome of our chess careers in the Soviet Union. Because I went up and then Sergei stayed a little bit in the uh, dark for a while, even though he's a great grandmaster, of course, and a great person. So, um, again, um, 
those years in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union. And when I came to the United States a year later, it, there was no Soviet Union anymore. So there was Gorbachev, Perestroika, and then suddenly it's Russia, right? So there were, those were like really crucial stuff uh, that's happening, but I felt that it doesn't really belong in the book where, where I wanted to put my memorable chess games where I wanted to actually share my chess experiences. And I felt that that stuff more actually belong in the autobiography, which I'm still thinking to to do at some point later in life. Ah, but, that, that's an interesting tease. Okay. Right. But um, right now I was more focusing on my uh, uh, chess uh, achievements, uh, some memorable chess games. And uh, obviously I felt that uh, I needed to include uh, some stories, some experiences, so I can get the reader into my mindset of what I was feeling at the time and what it was like. So the reader, when he reads the book, he can sort of get a feeling like he's walking alongside me. He's experiencing all that stuff. So that that was the point of my book. So that's uh, why I started in the U.S. Because, again, the U.S. in the 1989 when I arrived and the U.S. that it is now, I think it is somewhat different. Some two different time periods and the country is different and the people are different. You know, different cultures, I can say. And, again, it's... Um, it's something to keep in mind. But uh, back to the chess, yeah, I felt that that first tournament, you know, made a huge impression on me because the differences were huge. I mean, the tournaments that I played in Russia and this first tournament in the U.S., uh, New York Open, which, as you mentioned, is a legendary tournament. Unfortunately, it's been stopped many years ago. But and some of the modern players, I think, they don't even know about this tournament, that it happened, it existed even. Right, yeah. So yeah. I thought it was it was a good uh, good time to refresh their memory to make them be aware of some tournaments. I mean, everybody heard about the candidates in 1953, right? That uh, Bronstein Road yeah. and all the other candidate tournaments and other tournaments. Everybody knows about them. But what about the lesser tournaments? You know, so that that's uh, one of the things that uh, I also kept in mind in my book to give the viewer some idea of uh, what kind of chess exists in the world, not just the big top events, but also you know some smaller events which are still memorable. Yeah. Well, I've got to follow up about the New York Open. But first, I've also got a few questions from from uh, supporters of the podcast. I kind of jokingly chastised them last week because I, I didn't have any questions. But of course, for a guest of your stature, Gata, they came strong. So I've got I've got a few questions to sprinkle in. And number one is from uh, Peter Newhall. Thanks for the support, Peter. He asks, uh, what audience is your book intended for, in your opinion, for your peers, for club players, for strong players like FMs trying to get better or just to be a part of your legacy? Um, that's a difficult question, but, um, I, when I started to write my book, I, I was trying to make it more accessible to players of all levels. Um, the book that I was trying to model my book after was, uh, of course, Bobby's, um, memorable 60 games, right? I mean, that book was a classic. Um, um, uh, and, uh, he gets straight to the point. He doesn't give much. He just goes straight to the game and gives you all those sometimes nifty psychological descriptions or explanations of why he did this or why he did that. And, of course, um, the guy who co-wrote the book with him, um, Evans, I think, was it? Or somebody Larry else? Evans, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and they, they wrote those very nice, um, um, like, small text before. or They gave the nicknames yeah, to each game. Yeah, the, the, the introductory names. So that, that was extremely interesting. So I was trying to model my book after that, so give a reader an idea of how the top mind works, but also the same, at the same time to make those explanations more accessible. And uh, in the variations that I tried to show, um, again, my idea was to show the reader the beauty of the chess in all its glory, uh, that's why the games are included not just uh, with positional quality, you know, strategic quality where you move pieces around and then you go for a Rubenstein-like um, approach to trying to provoke weakness, then they go to the other flank, etc. But there are a lot of games which are tactical, you know, which feature a lot of uh, beautiful geometrical motives. Of course, um, since, uh, as I mentioned in my book, I am a big uh, fan of Lasker's uh, psychological approach to chess. Uh, psychology in chess always uh, played a huge role for me and that is why I try to impress on the reader how important this is especially at the top level I mean everybody knows like in boxing psychology is like the first and key thing right uh, but it, it also applies to chess it also applies to other sports 
So uh, when I write my book, I try to keep in mind that this book is uh, oriented for everybody, and especially, especially for those starting youngsters. Like when I was reading Fisher's book, I was very young. You know, and when you're young, you have this huge imagination. You don't need the chessboard to actually follow the game because you can you can follow it in your head. And uh, what you're doing is you're getting a pleasure out of reading the book, like it's a book, right? And at the same time, you go through those lines in your head, and you get uh, you get a certain uh, a sense of aesthetics. You know, you get a sense of beauty, and uh, that's that was my intent to make this game to open the chess uh, the, as the game following along the footsteps of the uh, past grades and to impress on the reader, you know, the things that I learned that uh, I felt was important, but also, again, the sense of the beauty of the game. Like uh, one of the movies that uh, I always felt great about it was American Beauty, and there's this concept of beauty, right, that is discussed there. And uh, that's what I wanted to achieve, you know, just to show people that chess can be beautiful, even if it is not flashy, if it is not like uh, combinational stuff, but it could be little things, like a little psychological trick here, a little positional trick there, or uh, the general setting of the uh, the general atmosphere, or even your opponent, which is a huge thing. It actually matters who the opponent is, right? It could be just uh, somebody you never faced before, or it could be your enemy, for example, or it could be somebody you played many times before. All these little different things, they all matter. And uh, I felt that, you know, in my book, I tried to bring as, as many as, as, uh, the diverse examples or, and the opponents as possible. So that was uh, my idea. And uh, hopefully every reader, no matter his age or sex or uh, orientation, you know, they will get something and learn something from the book. Yeah, and I, as as I said, we're recording this Sunday. I got the book Friday, so I was kind of in a unique situation, but I did read the whole thing. And Peter, I'll just give you my perspective, um, which is that anyone can benefit from it. I mean, the, the analysis is no joke. So, you know, I'm rated around... 2150 obviously people my level and much and significantly higher can learn from the chess because you you don't shy away from going into to thickets of variations about like uh things that could have happened and of course something i want to talk about later you you're able to check it with engines now uh which you which you couldn't at the time but there's also enough observations and enough about psychology and stuff that even if you're not that strong a player and even if you're not able to completely keep up with the analysis the beauty of game game collections is you're still able to pick up a few things and to, to gain perspective as you say and following up on um gaining perspective you mentioned uh being an advocate of um lasker's school of psychology and chess could could you explain for our listeners who may not know as much about it what, what you mean by this uh okay <laughs> it is kind of uh, difficult to explain a few words but uh, again, studying your former world champions in the past actually is the um, huge beneficial thing for uh, modern chess players, especially younger chess players, because uh, the, they can um, uh, studying that history helps you with the future, right? Uh, especially the chess battles. So uh, Emmanuel Lasker was the first to include uh, the element of observation and of psychology in the game of chess. For example, he, he was often uh, um, quoted on saying that a certain move, uh, you look at the opponent and figure out his style of play. So, for example, a move that would win against uh, uh, Zibir Tarish, right? It, 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 will, it might be not that great when you face somebody like Frank Marshall because the, uh, these two players are so uh, different in the chess style. One is purely positional, strategical, and the other is, uh, like, uh, you know, creator of the martial attack in Spanish game. It was, like, purely combinatorial, even uh, a little bit uh, slightly, how to say this, um, very dubious, a gambler, more like, uh, style of play. So, again, these little things, these little observations, they were the first uh, to be used in, in, in chess, and they were used to uh, a great success by Emmanuel last year. Uh, so... And um, later, this would be this approach would be used many times. Like for example, it would be expanded later in later years by Botvinnik, of course, and even then by Petrosian, who would use this uh, theory to advance his own um, system of prophylaxis, which everybody knows, of course. And uh, the famous Petrosian exchange sacrifices, the those were not just beautiful 
um, and aesthetically pleasing, but they, they were quite valuable and practical tools. For example, suddenly you think you have an advantage and then the Georgian sacrifices in exchange, blocks the entire position and leaves you with a bad bishop, uh, bad rook, for example, when his knight is untouchable, he's blocking everything and you don't know what to do. So uh, those concepts, they were new and uh, uh, very significant for uh, progressing chess uh, overall knowledge. So... Each world champion uh, bring, brought something new to the game. And uh, studying those uh, champions, especially the past champions, I think is uh, very important for modern uh, hopefuls for the world championship title. Yeah, and hopefully even in this computer age, they still are willing to, uh, to crack the books and do the work. Um, so circling back to the New York Open just for a minute, I couldn't, I couldn't leave alone because just for... A, a somewhat casual chess player like me to to read this book and to picture this this fifteen year old kid who's made his way um, from Russia to the United States and sort of being thrown into this vortex at the New York Open with all of this attention and then to play none other than uh, former world champion Mikhail Tal in in the early rounds uh, when you think back and to win like when you think back on the feeling how how did it feel to like uh, to go through so much and, and achieve so much um, at a relatively young age? Well, you know, just playing Mikhail, Mikhail Tai was one of the greatest uh, moments in my life, actually. You know, it is a dream that I would, I would never have been able to play him in Russia, of course, you know, in the same tournament. I'm not even talking, uh, uh, playing a game with him. And uh, here in New York Open, you know, we're... It's an open tournament. We have all, everybody playing, uh, from starting from 1,500 players, yeah, like to uh, someone like Mikhail Tal. So it was an incredible feeling. And, of course, I knew Tal before uh, because he was uh, coaching uh, Alexei Shirov, who was uh, my uh, like eternal competitor at that time because we were only two years apart. And we're still playing uh, each other these days. I right. mean, I, I played him last year at the World Rapid and Blitz Championship. And it's so interesting because we started playing each other when we were kids, like in junior Russian tournaments. And now we're both like 40-something, approaching 50, and we're still playing each other. Can you imagine the feeling? Yeah, that's <laughs> the like beauty of we, chess, yeah. Yeah, it's like we're no longer uh, contenders or even enemies, you know? Like we're, we're never enemies, of course, but still. Rivals, it's like more like yeah. your friends now, like right. your colleagues, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, uh, playing Tal was one of those moments when I felt like hey, it's amazing when you get to play one of the people you've only read in the books about, you know, the legendary Tal who who changed the world, literally. The the whole concept of chess was his uh, daring, attacking, uh, sacrificial style of play. You know, he was a legendary figure, of course. And to play someone like that was, for me, phenomenal uh, memory. So, as I mentioned in the book, when I played him, I felt like, you know, I had to do something spectacular. I, can't, I couldn't just play normal chess, you know, to try to, you know, t to be worthy of my opponent. So the game turned out to be also quite full of psychological tricks. And um, in the end, I was very lucky because it was my only game and my only win. But as I mentioned, of course, Tal was slightly different. He was older and his health was not that great. But still, the image of him... Is like eternally printed in my mind. Yeah, I can only imagine. Where, and were yeah. you especially nervous for that game? Of course, of course. There's no explanation for that. <laughs> but you seem to have, uh, you worked your way through it. It didn't didn't impact your play too much. It, didn't it seem... did. It did impact. Of course it did. Uh, because normally I don't play that, uh, that kind of chess, uh, the ones that I played against him. Yeah. Uh, I even prepared for the game against him, which was very unusual for me at the time, because uh, I tried to shy away from preparation and uh, uh, at all costs, which is my, uh, which was my usual thing. If the reader goes along with the book and uh, reads about my approach to chess, you will find that uh, I was always trying to keep uh, my game fresh and not to prepare because... Uh, in a way, I always uh, uh, felt that preparation is sort of cheating mm -hmm. because uh, it should be two minds playing each other over the board and trying to prove to each other which mind is stronger. But when you prepare, it's like, you know, going to exam with your um, uh, cheat sheet, right? Yeah. And Yeah, so that's that was my approach. But again, uh, chess is a unique, unique uh, profession because it combines the elements of science, of art, of uh, sport, and 
it can be anything for anybody. It can be anything, whatever you want it to be. So that's that's a unique and a great element about chess. And yeah. as I mentioned in the book, there are many different styles uh, that uh, have been utilized by people to great success, right? And uh, and the, the funny thing is that the 1991 U.S. Championship, there was this uh, opening ceremony, and the amazing remark by why, why one of the distinguishers, distinguished per- people who were invited there, he said, with amazement in his voice, he said that recently it's been found that crazy people can play chess. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that actually struck me. That struck me, and I kept it in my memory because because it is true, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might, yeah, it might even be an advantage. <laughs> it's not clear. That that's great, though. Um, so so after this New York Open, of course, y- your story is far from done. Uh, and over the next few years, you're you're ascending the ladder. You're just getting stronger and stronger. And pretty soon, you know, still a teenager. You're playing Karpov and Kasparov and all these other legends. So, what are your uh, most cherished memories from from uh, that period and those early brushes with uh, with uh, our chess heroes? Well, <laughs> uh, cherished memories. That's, well, yeah, um... I know that you had some interpersonal issues. I mean, you get in in the book a little bit to some uh, stuff away from the board that maybe yeah. <laughs> made it less enjoyable, but. But I mean, to me, from my perspective, it's just the idea of sitting across from them and playing them is what I fixate on. Right. Um, sure. I mean, of course, each of those encounters was the memory, uh, and uh, it, it is a battle. Uh, there is no, no, no others word with that because when I played other people, it was just a chess game. You know, we just uh, sort of enjoyed the game. And played each other like okay, made some preparation. Maybe I felt that this guy wants to win the game, but maybe he wants to beat me. He is contender, but there were other factors involved. But when you play somebody like Karpov and Kasparov, you get this absolute feeling that you're sitting across an absolute power that wants to smash you to atoms. Absolutely, <laughs> right. so simply to destroy you, or to leave you absolutely, to smear you into a small spot on the uh, on the chessboard. You get the sort of feeling uh, that killer, absolute killer instinct uh, from each of those players. And uh, the uh, ambitious would be a two mile word, you know, to put when you compare these guys. So when you when you actually play them, you can feel this energy. You can feel this uh, whole thing coming from them, like uh, you know. And 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 it's a unique feeling, of course. And uh, a lot of people uh, mention that uh, in their stories, but. Uh, to actually experience it is completely different, of course. So, but it's much easier when you're younger because uh, you don't think about such things. And uh, you can feel it, but you say, okay, so, okay, so I have nothing to lose, which is also important. When right. you're young and you have nothing to lose, then you can just play chess, right? But when you're older, you have other things to worry about, like family, kids, of course, things, things are completely different. But when you're young, that's your advantage. You're, you, it's just another lesson for you if you lose. And if you win, it's like sudden glory. You know, you, you beat this famous uh, champion or something. So in a way, it, it's a, it goes both ways. So they, 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 they want to beat this young upstart who, is, uh, who seems to be cocky, who is gathering all this attention. You know, and, and I can understand that you know, there is a certain uh, um, uh, view on their side, right? But for me, again, nothing to lose and just play a great champion, learn something from that. And each game, each loss that I took, and I took a lot of losses from these guys. I beat Kasparov only once in a tournament game. I lost to him like so many times, I I don't even know. Uh, Karpov I actually managed to beat quite a few times. And uh, I lost to him lots of also many games. Uh, But to play them is to, each of them has a unique style, which is great, works for them. But uh, they want to kill you in a different way, you know? Right. So that, that is quite memorable. Um, when I was, uh, you know, slowly improving, and of course the critical period for me was when I started to improve really rapidly. It was actually when I started to believe in myself. And that happened during the candidates uh, FIDE in 93. The interzone uh, happened in 93 in Bill. And, of course, we all know that there is the famous time also of the split uh, when Gary split from Fide and he created his own uh, uh, PCA. 
which created its own interzone, tried to create its own cycle, and naturally a lot of grandmasters played in both cycles, including me. But I was the only one who was lucky to get far enough in both cycles to actually uh, present the danger for both of them. And um, the only difference was that FIDE, you know, it was more, it was less authoritarian uh, organization, and it included a lot of people, so there was no way for them to put pressure on me. But in the PCA, basically, it was just all about Gary, and he could do whatever he wanted, so he applied pressure, and he, you know, including his lawyers, they, they tried to talk me into abandoning FIDE cycle, just to focus on his own cycle, but again, how can you trust a guy? Uh, who uh, who offers you to do this? Well, well, he can do this, and then the other day he can change his mind, and then remember what happened to Shiro, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we didn't know about that at the time because that would be a later story. But uh, at this time, uh, we could trust not this guy. So I played. I stayed in the FIDE Championship, and at the end we were correct because um, I got to play Karpov, but in the PCA. Um, I was forced to play Anand uh, right after my match with Salov, uh, and uh, uh, Anand had four months to prepare, what I, while I only had two weeks to prepare, and uh, that that would uh, seriously leave me um, uh, anger, angered at uh, Kaspar because I felt that he, he handled uh, this very strong-handedly, and he basically robbed me of my chance to uh, play Anand on even terms and to, you know, to even set up a fight because as the way match happened, I I I, I could not uh, even fight him. Uh, he basically outclassed me in the opening preparation. For a month is a huge time, and I could not match his preparation, and I lost that match. But if I had the same, if I had at least a month and a half to prepare, I would believe that my chances would be really good because I beat him in the theater, right? When I when I came from behind. So that that memory that uh, and there was another mem- memory from the uh, uh, earlier time period, uh, which you know first started started to um, come to my mind uh, with doubts about uh, Gary's uh, you know honest uh, claims. Uh, but okay, it's all in the past. Uh, but it, it it's still something that uh, taints my, my my memory and like. Uh, which uh, still gives me negative reactions uh, about Gary. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, of course, I always respected him as the greatest uh, chess champion in the world, and uh, about his chess, I could only say the greatest things. Um, but apart from that, I, I, I don't I didn't want to comment, because uh, personal experiences that uh, I had when dealing with him, as, aside from chess, they were not great. Okay. Um, yeah, well, well, thank you for, for saying as, as much as you did. I mean, and again, this is touched on in the book, but uh, just, just like one follow up, if, if you don't mind, do you have a sense? So when this match with Anand for, um, the PCA championship, uh, candidate cycle was scheduled, do you think that that was sort of, uh, intentional by Kasparov in order to sort of uh, stifle you, or do you think he just didn't care and he was just pursuing his no, own? No, uh, my feeling, and uh, that was a feeling of some people, which I cannot name, of course, uh, but at the time it was uh, hoped that uh, Anand would bring uh, a huge potential sponsor from uh, India okay. for his World Championship match. I could bring no such uh, money or sponsors. So... Uh, uh, the commercial aspect of the World Championship match, and of course, it's a huge thing because it's a crowning, uh, uh, it's a jewel, it's, it's a crowning jewel, right, of the whole qualification series. So uh, the World Championship matches were always um, something that everybody looked forward to and dreamed of in their lives because it's not just about the title, but also about the money because it has the greatest, absolute greatest prize fund of all in any chess tournaments in the world. The World Championship match is one event where you can become rich, uh, like over not overnight, but uh, during the course of the match. Because once the match is over, you're almost guaranteed to pay uh, at least half a million dollars, even if you lose the match. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mul- multi- many multiples yeah. higher than any and other. And at that time, uh, Gary he was uh, going for the corporate sponsors. I believe Intel was uh, sponsoring him, but uh, there were some already setbacks. And uh, they were hoping for Anand's uh, sponsors. Again, uh, it is my opinion. I can be absolutely wrong. So uh, a lot of things that I mentioned in my book, I said that uh, I mentioned from my 
opinion. That's the way I view things. Sometimes the editors, they didn't agree with it, but they went along with it because they understood how strongly I felt about certain things. Uh, and again, I could be wrong in the explanation, but the fact that uh, Gary wanted to play Anand more than me, that was absolutely clear and clear in my mind. Okay. I mean, I was just a kid who could offer nothing because uh, who was behind me? I had no sponsors. Uh, the only sponsor that I had, and I'm very grateful to him, was in 1989 before my dad actually, uh, you know, fallen out with him because he was uh, afraid that he was going to start losing control over me. And uh, so that's why he he told me, he forbid me from seeing that sponsor again, James Kane from Bear Stearns so on the Wall Street Company. It was a fantastic uh, person, very kind, and uh, he was into chess uh, and uh, other things. He was a great bridge player also. So, again, uh, I had nothing and nobody uh, to support me. So, And Anand, he was, of course, a huge figure. And uh, But then the history shows that they played the match at the World Trade Center. And, of course, that's a phenomenal thing because World Trade Center will forever be in every American mind, especially after the events of 9-11. Right? So... And uh, there is no such thing as World Center anymore. So that event is like in history forever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for being so forthcoming. I mean, that's that's incredible perspective. And obviously, I mean, if not, like, what better format for you to to share, as you say, your opinions? I mean, your your memories of what happened and what the motiva- motivations were for it than your own book. Um, so we're we're really really grateful to get to to um to read it uh, and hear you talk about it. So one more question on the book, if you don't mind, Gata, um, from a supporter of the podcast, Chris Wayne Scott, and you already touched on this, but just to sort of uh, finish it, finish it up, he says, Chris says, "Hi, Gata. First, let me say thanks for introducing me to Pie in St. Louis. That pizza is amazing." My question is, do you plan on continuing to write more books? It seems like it would be a shame if you wrote only your best games collections. Well, I, you know, originally I was planning to write a book on London system because everybody knows that. uh, People love you for your work on the London system. It's uh, yeah. And it's amazing. I mean, so many people quote me on the London system and it seems to be one of the hardest uh, selling uh, items uh, and there are so many books on London system they are so well organized and they're so well written and I feel like you know these people spend so much effort and writing all these books you know and they actually quoting me like a lot of my games in it and they're thanking me so I said like hey I already did my part so I, I why should I write the book on the London system everybody writes so well and they already did it and they did it in a great way and I actually stopped following the London system. I stopped working on it. So no more updates from me, guys. So you have to go <laughs> your own way now, find okay. all those new things. But I'm really glad that it uh, finally received re- the recognition. It's been uh, played at the very top level for many years now. And I'm very happy that uh, my small sort of role in, in developing one obscure opening into the chess theory has evolved and it actually, you know, enriched chess. So I'm very grateful for that. And with regards to the other books, well, I, I don't think I'm a great author. I'm just uh, wanted to share some of my insights, some of my experiences, some of my games. And I feel, uh, you know, I, I I don't think I'm such a great teacher. You know, I, I had some students, but um, very few of them actually made progress, which made me doubt my. Uh, Thing because you know you can be a great player, but to be a great teacher you need that something uh, very special. You know, well, and not uh, not all great players have that. That's so true. I, I don't consider myself as a really great player, but uh, you know I'm I was lucky enough to be at the top level, so I consider to be very lucky and to be a one time top level and chess challenger again. So I still have some understanding of the game, but you know it's like it could be so specific. And it's very difficult to transfer it to somebody else, you know, all this practical knowledge because uh, you have to experience it yourself in order to utilize it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to write more books. Uh, I'll be really glad to make the ones that I write actually do count, and I'll be very grateful and uh, thankful if people find these books useful and the, these books can teach them or show them or, discover, or let them discover something about chess that they didn't know before. And that's my goal. If I, if I manage to do at least one of those things, I'll be extremely happy. 
And I would feel that, you know, I shared that with the chess people. And, uh, you know, that would make me really happy. Okay. Well, one th- couple of things I just want to throw throw in. Number one, there's a there's a difference between you you say maybe you feel like you're not the best teacher at least based on the results of your student, but but teaching and writing about chess can be sort of separate skill sets as well. So, I was pretty impressed with your book and and the writing itself I was impressed with. I mean, you've got like some nice turns of phrase in there, and of course you're so well steeped in chess history that you're able to to pull in quotes and perspective from from your knowledge of previous world champions uh and stuff like that so for so I can't speak to the, your ability as a teacher, but as a writer, I definitely enjoyed the work and wouldn't I wouldn't let uh any perceived uh, lack of talent in writing dissuade me from writing if I were you. That's just my two cents. Um, oh, thank so you, man. you're welcome. And, I, and obviously, a, an autobiography or something more chess related, I would be happy to see. Um, now, pivoting to a different topic, Gata, uh, our listeners are always hungry to hear more about chess improvement. Um, so I want to kick it off with a question from um, the mysterious and beloved supporter of Perpetual Chess, Mr. Moonmaster9000. Um, so Moonmaster asks, when, when you were developing from amateur to grandmaster, what training methods did you find most valuable and what training methods did you find least valuable? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, You're a fan of the Moonmaster too? <laughs> I'm uh, quite intrigued. Uh, <laughs> By this uh, very mysterious moon master exactly. that you mentioned. Uh, but the, about the chess uh, improvement, um, I think my m- main chess improvement came uh, so rapidly because of the one thing. I was just really young, and uh, when you're young, you just catch things. Uh, you don't really necessarily, I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily studied chess. But I did follow a famous Capablanca uh, saying that you should study your lost games because they would give you more benefit than your won games. So definitely analyze and study your games in detail. So that's one incredible lesson. Um, definitely works. Uh, the second one is that for each player, each person is different. Uh, for, for a practical player who's, who likes playing chess but he doesn't like to study chess, I would recommend uh, something that I would do, and I'm still doing it a little bit, is you should play more tournaments. Because uh, it is much easier than to study your games that you just play than to uh, look at certain opening and force yourself to look through the books or go through the databases. So when you play a tournament, you just play a game, you come home, you analyze your game, and basically you're forced to look at a certain line anyway, right? right? So so that 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 seems to be an easy approach. So I'm a way, I'm a big fan of this uh, easy easy uh, study approach um, because uh, studying all those books, I always hated it to be honest. I oh, mean, right. my father, when I was young, he would uh, give me this huge uh, huge uh, stack of chess books and he'd tell me you should study all of them. Of course, you know, I didn't know then. Uh, that when I was younger, he was just joking. Obviously, he didn't expect me to go through all those books, but I felt like, hey, I have to go through all those books. So I would shuffle the books, and I would read some kid book, and I would shuffle the books, and it would look like, you know, I went through all those books, and my dad would come home, and he would ask me, like, did you go through all those books? I said, yeah, with a serious face. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I wouldn't realize, of course, he, he knew that I was lying because it was very, very obvious, but, uh, <laughs> but some things like that, you know, do, do, do actually not work. So, um, yeah, the best, uh, my advice is would be to do this. This is what also Karpov did. So you play a lot of tournaments, you study your games. And um, the other thing, of course, as I mentioned, when you're younger, you pick up things faster. It's like languages, right? Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, you can, you can improve in chess, uh, always improve in chess, but just when you're older, it takes longer. And um, there are other things, you know, that, that, that take your time. Because, when, again, when you're younger, you can do chess, and that's basically all your... Uh, and if you're in school, you do school, right? right. So, but that, that's basically all that you have to do in life at that moment, and you're carefree. You don't worry about it because your parents take care of everything. Um, so, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, that's... So that's why, that, that's why most of... That's why there's this famous saying by Russian Grandmaster Kalifman, right? He says that the, yeah. if, you're, if you're married, 
then forget about the world championship title, <laughs> right? That's that is like famous joke in Russia, because uh, you get other things. You cannot do chess anymore. You cannot focus on them solely, and um, and uh, th- 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 there's a huge dis. Th- there was always a huge dis- dispute about that. Because if you want to be world champion, then you gotta be like Bobby. You have to be crazy about chess. You have to do them like twenty four seven, seven days a week, etc. Um, and of course, now you have to be because chess got a lot faster. You have faster time controls. You know, it's more like sport now. A lot of people like to, you know, catch you in the computer analysis. So you have to practice your tactics. You have to be uh, aware of the um, uh, strategic moments. You have to know a lot of openings because uh, in the computer age era, again, uh, you can study with the computer basically any opening line. And even if it is considered dubious, you can always find something, some line which is not well-known or well-played, and the computer will show you that there is not so simple to prove an advantage for white or inequality for black either. So basically, you have to be prepared for any opening. You have to be prepared for any nasty computer surprise there where a computer knows all the next uh, 15, 20 moves. So it's very hard to talk about improvement because... Uh, there are several goals. Uh, do you want to win the tournament or you want to improve your chess overall? And these could be completely different things. Yeah, yeah. It can be hard to to have the big picture in mind when you just have the next game right in front of you. Uh, yeah. uh, well, well, that's great advice. One thing I wanted to follow up on was uh, you mentioned uh, the pile of books that your dad would leave you with. And of course, uh, the amount of chess books you read as a, a young star chess player is sort of the stuff of, of legend. So it's surprising to hear you say that you didn't read a lot of those books. So my question for you, Gata, is when, when, you're, when you were in your room and your dad thought you were reading those books, what were you actually doing? I was reading uh, kids' books. I oh, my dad. My dad had a huge library of books. You know, thankfully, he was a big fan of all those philosophies. So I was reading anything from kids' books to some romance by a French romantic. Uh, and then I was reading some philosophy on Eastern philosophies and uh, any, any, anything but chess, really. Huh. Of course, I had to still to do some, some chess stuff. I mean, he would give me, uh, when I went to school, he would give me uh, a chess study like by Kasparian or by Kubel, those are really famous. And actually, uh, I, I owe them a lot uh, in my endgame uh, understanding. So one of the basics in chess you have to know absolutely is how to play the end games. So that, that, that I completely agree with. And the best way to study those games is actually to study those famous composers and to study end game, uh, end game composers. So Kubel and Kasparian, they gave me the sense of beauty in chess, and they actually taught it to me. And uh, so when I went to school, he told me, that, so you have five or four classes, you have 10, 15 minutes in between the classes. So what you do is you have to do three studies a day, three or four studies a day. And uh, while all those kids, you know, they were having fun between the classes, you know, I, w- I-, I would be forced to skip on all the socializing, you know, all this uh, very important kid stuff, and I had to do all those uh, chess studies. And, um, and you know, uh, th- th- there is a c- very conflicted uh, feelings about that, part, that uh, time period. In terms of chess, yes, those studies were important, but I felt like I missed a lot of good things as well. Yeah. Okay? But in terms of chess, uh, studies are very good, especially end games. Because uh, one of the things that I noticed in the present generation kids is that uh, they're, they're absolutely great in theory. They know all those complicated lines. They play computer moves. They can see tactics. And uh, if they, in the past they said that the strategy is the main thing and tactics uh, should be based on the strategy, right? Well, this is all out of the window because uh, now, the, now you cannot do a strategic plan if it falls apart in 2-3 combo, right? If there is a tactics uh, which leaves your plan in ruins in 2-3 moves, there is, the, there is nothing that you can do. And uh, all the modern openings are based on a lot of tactics. A lot of lines are simply forced. But if you're able to survive all that, if you're able to survive into the end game where you're worse, but it is playable, then there is a pretty good chance that, that you can outplay any youngster because uh, they simply don't know how to approach the end game. And that's where your knowledge, that's where, 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 where you get all the chances how to beat these kids. So if you if, if you guys like older, you know, like... You know, mark this advice, 
So I'm telling you how to beat the youngsters. Mm -hmm. it, it could be really important. So bring, in, bring them to the end game where your experience will help you beat them. Okay? So yeah, that's... I don't that that's great advice i don't know how old moonmaster 9000 is but but uh but that's yeah it, uh, ben feingold called it old man chess um do you think that they're weaker positionally as well or is it primarily uh end game um uh, strictly end games well uh, as i said uh, these days it's very difficult to say what is more important because again more than chess are all about the uh, tactical possibilities and strategy it seems now uh it has to. It, it, it's really complicated to play strategic, pure strategic chess because the uh, what is this? Uh, how to say this? Um, the very concrete chess, right? It's, right? it's a time period where every line, every move, you know, every tempo is extremely important and, and can be punished by your opponent. So uh, there, there is there are certain still strategic openings left, but uh, there are very few of those. And even if you play them, there are always some lines uh, where everything can be forced and you're forced to calculate tactically. So tactics, you should, you should solve a lot of tactics because you need, you need to be aware of that and you need to be, calculate well. I mean, a lot of uh, play, players, even at the top level, if you look at the recent tournaments, uh, even top players, they make blunders, right? And suddenly the computer says the game is like zero, 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 even, and then suddenly blunder, boom, and it's uh, minus five, minus six, and you can resign, yeah? So, and, and it happens all the time. So tactical vision is extremely important. So, again, training your tactics is important. Okay. Um, excellent advice. Um, and do you feel, got a? do you have a sense for, so you mentioned you weren't studying as much as it was pre presented uh, to the outside world. Do you feel like you, you had a lot of talent at chess or to what do you uh, mainly attribute the success that you had? Well, I would say that uh, in chess, yes, actually there is uh, such thing as the natural gift. I mean, uh, I mean every, every person is good at something, right? Right. And what, what, what is uh, specific about chess, again, as I mentioned, it is both art, it's not just both, it's, it contains elements of everything, like art, again, sport and stuff. And because it contains elements of all those, there's pretty good chance that the person who's playing chess is pretty good at at least one of those elements. Yeah. So I would say that uh, that's why almost every person who plays chess is absolutely gifted. And he, he if he is... Uh, um, he has time and energy, right? And he's young. He's, you can basically make world champion out of anybody if he's like, if, if the kid is five years old, right? He's a normal kid. And, and, and if you train him correctly, if you give him a, like a whole band of coaches like Kasparov had, right? Sure. Like in Russia, he was the only one who had a huge team of helpers thanks to his uh, connections, you know, to his mother, to his political connections, and etc., etc. Uh, all the rest of the kids in Russia, they, they, they never had a chance like that. If they had a chance like that, there would be so many Kasparovs you wouldn't believe. Hmm. Um, but he was the only one who actually had such a support, which is why he's Kasparov. He was also very early the only one who had access to the computers. And uh, that also gave him an, a huge advantage. I mean, these days it's taken for granted that the, 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 the opening preparation is based on a lot of computer assist, assistance. But at that time, not many people knew about the computers, and the computers were considered to be uh, not that strong. But if you had like five or ten computers, you know, and they've been left analyzing overnight, and you had assistants working with the computers who knew how to work with the computers, like, for example, Romajin Hashvili, uh, who introduced me to the, uh, this whole thing with computers, how to work with them, how to work with them correctly, to understand the, you know, to work with the computers correctly, you need to understand their weaknesses and their strength point, strong points. So he taught me how to work with the computers. And that was a huge opener for me, a huge discovery. I realized that I was missing a lot of, a lot of things. So, again, um, uh, chess gives you an ability to reach a lot of things. You don't have to be talented, but uh, basically you have an inner talent for something in any profession. But in chess you have a lot of possibilities because it uh, contains a lot of things from life. So, um, yeah, uh, Okay, great advice. And we've just got one more listener question, and then I just have a few more questions if you're up for it, Gata. This has been yeah. amazing. 
Um, so the listener question, and uh, this listener said he was looking forward to hearing me try to pronounce his name. So uh, wish me luck here. Uh, Vy- Vyakoslav Nemec. He's Croatian, and my, my Croatian is uh, non-existent. But hopefully I was in the ballpark, Vy- Vy- Vyakoslav. Um, so he asks... Uh, he asks uh, in the history. He says in the history of chess, there have been many prodigies with great potential who didn't become top players. What do you think is the reason? And you just touched on this a little. And then he says, "What can parents and chess trainers do to ensure a balance between being a chess professional and having a, a normal childhood at an early age?" Well, that's a, again a question that touches on a lot of things, and uh, you can't really respond to it uh, uh, even uh, for an hour if you try to. I will, I will touch on again on the thing that uh, the first part of the question. If you're a very talented kid and you have some coaches, but you didn't make it to the world championship title, I mean, let's. Uh, I, I don't want to make any uh, to make any offense, but let's, for example, take a look at Giri, right? Mm-hmm. We all know Giri. Um, yes. Yes, Anish Giri. He's been at the top level for many, 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 many years, right? He's been playing. Uh, Vikanze for many years, he had a lot of coaches, world-class coaches, right? Um, and uh, he is still, I mean, he probably won some strong events. I just don't remember at the moment which ones he did. But um, he's still very strong grandmas, right? He's at, the, he's at the very top right there. But... Uh, the, he still didn't make it to the candidates, like uh, he didn't make it to the world championship title, and he's had all the all the chances, right? I would say he still has many years, of course, ahead of him to try for it, so he may. But um, that's a perfect example of somebody who had a lot of coaches and uh, who didn't make it uh, to become world champion. Um, what is missing? Uh, that is a good question. So uh, perhaps it's best to ask him what is missing because I'm sure he knows the answer to that. Um, hmm. But uh, the, how many other players who have such a huge team of uh, helpers? There are not that many. I mean, it all has to be together. I know, for example, in the U.S. now that the Singfels, uh, they, they've been pouring a lot of energy, their time into chess, and they created chess, and they created this wonderful absolute city of St. Louis, which is the capital of the chess in the United States, right? And they've been uh, helping uh, a, a lot uh, Hikaru, they've been helping a lot Grana, and um, maybe even Wesley, uh, though uh, with Wesley I'm not that sure, but I'm pretty sure that they, that Grana and Hikaru, they received a lot of support from these guys. Uh, I didn't receive uh, any support from them when I was a candidate, but okay, that's okay because I was always considered Russian, a Russian in America, which was always uh, made me very sad oh. because I, I lived in the U.S. for 30 years and I still considered Russian. So even though I played for the Olympic team, I, I brought, uh, I helped uh, the U.S. Uh, you know bring some uh, Olympic medals, bronze medals, even gold medal in '93, etc. But uh, Still, but the, what can you do? You know, you if you're born in one country, can you can, can you you know what can you do? Anyway, uh, that's not the point. The point is uh, how many actually kids they do get such a support. I mean, even these days, the way that that Kasparov had support, uh, he, I would say he, he he had much greater support than Giri that we just talked about, right? And uh, of course, a lot depends on the coach as well. Uh, for example, there were famous stories about Spassky, um a coach. I, don't, I think it was Boleslavsky. And there were some legends uh, about his uh, Im- impulsive nature. Because Spassky is, is, is more like a melancholic type of player. I mean, he he's ex- was extremely talented, but it was claimed to be he was also extremely lazy. So his coach had to always push him to work harder. So there, 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 there has to be that chemistry you know, what I'm talking about, there has to be the correct chemistry. You mm-hmm. have to have a correct coach. It's not just like any coach. Right. You have to find the right coach for you. The the one that pushes you, the, the one that compliments you. It's not like you, if you're two of the same, it's not going to be the same as like uh, if you compliment each other, right? There's that um, moment of uh, synergy. So... Um, all those little details, they work. And that coach, he has to be really, really dedicated to make you world champion. Basically, you're asking that coach 
uh, to forget his professional approach. You're asking that coach to dedicate his entire life for you, right? Um, the only, of course, other exception, of course, is Magnus Carlsen. I mean, uh, that guy, he's a world champion, but why he is a world champion? I played that kid when he was uh, very young. I played him first time in 2005 World Cup, and I also mentioned all that in my book, of course. Uh, and then I played him again in the World Cup of 2007. I eliminated him on both time, both occasions. But uh, there was a clear and obvious uh, difference, you know, th- how the guy grew. He, he was extremely talented, and he was, you know, his playing strength was much different. He was much stronger in 2007 than he was in 2005. Still, that would not guarantee him uh, the success in the future. I remember I had a discussion with him after one World Cup. I'm not sure which one it was, 2005, 2007. But I had a really big chat with him at the airport. And um, I I, I felt that he had, this kid had a huge potential. So I talked to him and I I think I advised him on a few things. And uh, the next thing you know, this guy, he is working with Kaspar, which I think is the critical, absolute critical moment, which actually pushed him and made him the world champion. Because without that work with Gary without all that insight, without all that dedication from Gary, without that uh, energy, and uh, he would never become the world champion. Hmm. That to me is, that is my purely humble opinion, but uh, that the one that I feel very strongly about it. So, you know, in order to become the best, you have to learn from the best. You have to learn, and he, it doesn't have to be merely chess. When, you, when, you, when you're in, in the contact with such person, you know, there's not always verbal stuff, right? That goes that you can commu- that you communicate that you that you take. Sometimes it's a certain trace of the character. Sometimes it's uh, psychological things. Sometimes the attitude. You know, you you learn all that stuff. You know, you, you copy some stuff even subconsciously, right? And you learn and and you add it to yourself and you become something greater than you were before. Anyway, so he learned a lot uh, from him chess wise. And he learned from him uh, a lot of things, other things. And I feel that uh, that was the critical missing element. And I'm not sure that, uh, you know, all, all the other players, they can get that kind of level of dedication because I know that Gary work, worked later with other kids, but there might be something missing. He wasn't probably working with a similar dedication that the one he worked with Magnus, you know, because sometimes once the coach worked with someone, right, he gave him everything, absolutely everything, his entire energy dedication, and there is nothing left in him for the others. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that necessarily that uh, uh, it, that it can work again. Maybe it's just one, 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 one hit wonder. So uh, there are a lot of theories. But uh, to me, you know, it was the right time and the right place and the right coach for Magnus, which made him world champion. Without it, he would not become world champion. Wow. I can almost guarantee you that. That's interesting. So I guess for the young phenoms that we see right now, like uh, Vincent Kemar from Germany is working with Peter Leco, and lately uh, Faruja from Iran has just been unstoppable. So I don't know if they've paired well, up w- with players of that stature yet, but I guess it would, well, would be the, good advice. The, there, is, there is a moment of danger because uh, when you're young and rapidly progressing, yeah, uh, there is a the critical time. There is a time of uh, where even a half a year matters a lot. I mean, these kids are very talented, but you remember a lot of American guys, right? We had like Patrick Wolf, then uh, what else? Ilya Gurevich, and we also had um, some other kids who were extremely talented to play strong chess. Like, I think it was a uh, British uh, Stewart, uh, right? Uh, Conquest. Uh, um, uh, there were some other guys who were extremely, extremely talented, very strong uh, potential world championship material. But then they quit chess because, you know, there were other matters that came into a moment and made them stop playing chess. And what I was going to say is that there is a certain time period where you have to get that luck of uh, either getting that support just in time and getting that coach just in time. Because if you miss and you, and you do the same thing for the next couple of years and suddenly you're 21 and then suddenly you're 23 and you're still at the same level. And then you're no longer hopeful then you're just uh, an ordinary grandmaster anymore, yeah? Yeah. So, so these kids, while they, they, they're both very talented, right? I played with them a lot uh, on the chess.com, and uh, uh, I, 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 I absolutely feel uh, how, how very talented and strong they are. But again, 
if the kids are missing for next couple of years, they don't get the kind of support they need or the coach they need. That's all they're going to be. Interesting. Wow. Well, it'll be interesting to track. And, and, and the best thing for them to do is right now is the best thing to do is to learn from the best. And that's why in order to learn from the best, you need to play with the best. And that means you have to qualify for the candidates and you have to play in the candidates. Because if you remember Bobby Fischer, right, he qualified uh, for the candidates, I think, when he was 16 the first time. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, he played all the strongest players in the world by the time when he was 16. Can you imagine? Yeah. Obviously, he failed, but he learned so much from that experience. He learned so much that, uh, you know, he failed the first time. And I think he failed the second time also, but he learned from each time and that got him stronger. When you play the strongest, you learn so much. And, and that's why he was able to beat them finally alone against the entire system, against the uh, how to, uh, against what he always claimed and uh, which I felt it was always true. You know, the grandmasters agreed to draw between each other and try to focus to beat Bobby. Well, it was absolutely the natural thing to do. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure, and everybody everybody knows that, that that was actually true. Just nobody can prove this. But uh, everybody knows that this, uh, in fact, happened. So, again, uh, so that's what you need. Like Magnus, he was playing in the World Cup when he was, uh, I don't know, 13 or 14 the first time. And then he, next time he was 16. And he played, and he, he qualified further and further closer to the top. And he played the strongest players. And uh, when I was playing the World Cup when I won it, Right, I became the number three in the world. So uh, with a huge experience. So I believe that these kids, if they want to learn and they they need to, you know, to to grow faster, they need to qualify and play all those top people and learn from that. And only then they have a good chance of uh, you know challenging the world champion. Hmm. Because right now it seems that there is only Magnus and Corana. Nobody else right now. Yeah. I don't see anybody else uh, for the next. Uh, at least next two or three years, I don't see anybody. Yeah. I mean, okay? That's my personal opinion. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's really interesting. Just um, one or two follow-ups from, from things you've said. So you mentioned... Um you mentioned with St. Louis uh, that, that you were disappointed not to get as much uh, support as some other players. Does Is that part of the reason for, for you not having been in the, the U.S. championships recently? And do you, do you think you'll no, ever play another uh, one? Well, I'm sure I'll pretty, pretty play. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure I'll play there. No, that 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 uh, support, I was uh, very upset about it, and uh, but it's okay. That life, that 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 happens. You know, they don't have to support me, but uh, you know, it's just uh, that feeling. I, I didn't feel great because you know I was the candidates, and I felt that I still had a chance still to qualify. And if you remember, in in 2012, I played in Kazan. Right, and uh, I beat Tapalov in the first round, and I played Gelfand, and as a tiebreaker, I lost to him. And later, Gelfand qualified for the World Championship match against Anand. Right, so I, and I felt that it could have easily been me if I just I had a little bit more support, if I just had a little bit more help, even financial. Right. I remember pretty well that uh, uh, at that year, I was uh, talking to the uh, representative from the SCS Federation, and I told them that uh, I'm playing candidates. But uh, I have to pay everything. I have to pay my team out of my own pocket. I have to pay my coaches, and I have to pay uh, for the travel and for everything. And I have absolutely no support. So what happened at the closing ceremony, this gentleman, he stood up in front of everybody, and he was uh, very generous. You know, He stood up, and he mentioned that I'm playing in the candidates and that he was asking the people in the room to support me. So the rest of the... People from the US Chess Federation, they all managed to donate about $1,000 in total for me. But uh, that's about it. Nobody else, nobody else, you know. And I think uh, 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 Mr. Rich from St. Louis Club, he he also donated something. But, you know, compared to the amount the other guys got, I mean, uh, and even this $1,000, it was great, of course, but... You know, compared to all the expenses that I had, it was nowhere even close to cover at least the expenses. Yeah, for, and for, for travel. So yeah. you know that that made me that made me somewhat upset. But okay, uh, you know, I, I like to think positively about things, and I realized, of course, you know, that you know probably there were some other factors involved why I wasn't supported. But overall, I was really happy that at least 
you know, Chess was supported. That means that there would be other players, other talents, you know, other people who would get the support. And I was very happy when, you know, when we got Kiruana, when we got Hikaru, and we, and we got Wesley, and these guys were actually supported, and uh, especially Kiruana, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, that, that, you know I don't want to be selfish. I'm, I'm pretty happy for these guys. So they got support, and, and as we saw, Kiruana really got really close in the World Championship match, and he had his shot, and uh, he learned his lesson that uh, it's no longer just about theory, it's also about sport. It's also about learning how to play well, not just in the classical game, but it's also about learning how to play in the um, tiebreakers, right? Which were the key. Mm-hmm. So that that was one of the key moments. So uh, hopefully he learned his lesson. He would uh, improve his game in other uh, types of chess, which is critical. Yeah, and uh, that works. But basically, I moved to Russia because I met my wonderful wife at that time and uh, you know in my life you know chess of course is important but uh, the people that are close to me they were much more important to me than chess always and uh, ever since I got free from my uh, parents uh, influence you know uh, I I valued each moment each person that came close to me and uh, my wife was extremely important she was very helpful and I thank you very much for helping me to finish this book project you know, without her, I would never finish it. You know, to be honest, uh, I would start, but I would postpone it. And with her help, I managed last year, and especially with the help of the editors, uh, who were extremely supportful. I thank Romain, and I thank Dan from the Thinkers Publishing, and I was able to finish this book, you know, the, which is a yeah. huge achievement. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And we're and we're looking forward to, to the second volume. So, um, and and while we wait for that, uh, are you going to be doing any more streaming or going to be on hiatus from that? What do you think, Gata? Well, I was doing a lot of streaming on the chess.com because I feel that the chess, as it is, um, uh, during the last uh, couple of decades, even this time, especially under the recent uh, uh, changes in FIDA, you know, chess it remained the same while everything in the world moves, right? Hmm. If, if you guys remember the esports, they just started like four or five years ago, and there's been a huge momentum, and there is a lot of sponsorship, and there is a lot of great things in the esports. A lot of people uh, are very enthusiastic about it. And when I, when I found about that, I was very, uh, very concerned because chess could have been that esport, and they could have been uh, making waves and making all those people and everybody. Right now in the world, in the world right, there's only like top 20 players who can make a living by playing professional chess, right? In the esports, you have a lot of people who earn uh, decent salaries, right? And that's, that's what I said. Uh, you know, esports today is what chess should have been like a couple of decades ago. So, uh, a lot of people, I think, not actually a lot of people, but at least people on chess.com, I think I made some posts on the Facebook, I made some posts on the Twitter to that effect that, you know, chess is a perfect esports e-sport actually because, you know, it can be played online on the internet, could be played anywhere, from your phone, from your, from your computer. You know, you can have teams, you can have a lot of excitement, people from all over the world, you know, joined and playing the same game, like, right, we all love chess. So... And, um, you know, Chess.com, they, they started to create this uh, Pro Chess League. It's run by Greg Shehari. And uh, they were separate before, but then they joined forces. So all those events now run on Chess.com. they also been running some Title Tuesday events for, I don't know, a few years now, I think. Yeah. And uh, just two years ago, they started playing, uh, creating those Arena King tournaments. You know, some cash prizes for the players. So I've been playing those events. And uh, that's where I've been, because when you, when you play online, you have to stream to prove that you are who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody knows about the cheating cases, right? And just right, especially when yeah. you face online. And every tournament, there's still some cheaters, you know. Uh, and that's a big, of course, thing for chess, so, which is a huge, <clears throat> biggest danger. I mean, the, the, the well-known cases of uh, accusations of cheating in chess, even in tournament chess, in live chess, yeah? But here we're talking about internet, where you can hide behind your screen. You can be anybody. You can have friends sitting next to you, you know, giving you moves, etc. So there are a lot of ways to cheat. 
and uh, a lot of people are caught. Even some of the grandmasters have been banned and caught. You know, they just their names uh, were not uh, publicized. You know, to to spare them from all this uh, scathing uh, attack by the chess community. But uh, Fide. Uh, needs to come up with some st- really strong guidelines and rules because uh, cheating is really unacceptable. Um, I-, I believe that uh, it should be like in cycling, right? Uh, if, ben, you admi- yeah. if you've caught cheating, all your titles should be immediately taken from you, yeah. right? Because uh, this, this, it's not just you steal money, which is basically you, st- you steal somebody else's livelihood, right? Chess players don't make a lot of money. So any money that you steal, it, it could be incredibly important to the other person. So that that is one of the things that I really feel strongly about, and I feel that uh, International Federation is not doing much to address this concern. But it should be addressed. It, 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 been, it should have been addressed at least five years ago. And they created some commissions, but still there are not you know, clear rules um, and it's still not being addressed. So, so do you think yeah. there's a, a lot of cheating in tournament chess right now? Like, I, I definitely agree with you about online, and it's unfortunately an uphill battle, although hopefully the engine detection yeah. can at least uh, stem the tide. But in live, do you think that even at the top levels, there's cheating the, the, taking the, place? Well, I'm not sure about the top level, because top level grandmasters, they, why would they risk cheating? Because... Uh, I mean, th- th- there there are some special cases, but uh, it's more of a concern at the club level these days, right? Yeah. In, the open, in the open tournaments. Yeah. But of course, the top level chess they have their own, they have their own, you know, um, as I said, cases which are also well known. They cannot be proven, so we're not going to talk about these guys. But uh, it's been a concern, and um, the lack of concern from international federation is also another cause of concern, <laughs> which is uh-huh. funny, but it's ironic, but it is true. So, cheating in chess is the topic, and of course now we can, that, that is related to the next question, because uh, what is the alternative? And the alternative is uh, uh, the fish random chess. Yeah. Right? That, uh, that is the subject, again, that I feel very strongly about it, and I'm really happy that uh, earlier this year, FIDE made a post, a short, very short post, and I hope they don't change their mind. They actually want to start to invest in the Fish Random Chess, and they want to create the first Fish Random Chess World Championship this year. That would be great, yeah. So that's, again, everybody has their own opinion, and but it will be nice to have also another tournament. You can have classical chess, but why not? Why, why can't you have a Fish Random Chess? I mean, I remember many years ago in Mainz, if you remember, there were these uh, great Fisher Random Open tournaments and uh, and rapid events. There were like unofficial World Championships. A lot of top players came, and it was so nice, you know, when you have no theory, when you can just play chess and uh, just enjoy chess mm-hmm. and create something. Like for example, I beat Mamedyarov like in five moves because he blundered his knight. You know, he was playing white and he blundered his knight like after five moves of no theory, like completely weird position. Right. It was a very, very tricky geometry, like a grandmaster, like losing a knight. Can you believe it? Right. No, it doesn't happen normal chess. Anyway. Cool. Uh, these are my thoughts and I hope you guys, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, Gata, I just want to thank you for being so generous with your time. This has been incredible. Um, and listeners, buy the book. You support this man. I mean, he's uh, devoted his life to chess, and this this book is well worth it. I, I wouldn't steer you guys wrong. So um, I'll post everywhere to get it. Um, you guys can follow him on Twitch. Is there anywhere else where people should go to keep up with you, Gata? Uh, I'm also on Facebook. and. Okay. Uh, so that that is nice. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. This has been uh, an honor and a privilege and quite enjoyable on top of that. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks to everyone who makes Perpetual Chess possible. Of course, that includes Matthew Passy, my producer, and Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music. I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show. That includes people who tell their friends, tweet about it, share on Facebook. Apparently, Instagram is a thing. Every little bit helps grow the show. But most of all, I want to thank people who support the show financially. I've said this before, but Perpetual Chess is my most gratifying but least paying work. If everyone who listens to the show were able to kick in $1 a month, 
it would be my best paying and most gratifying work. So I want to thank those who are able to provide financial support. That includes extra special thanks to Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Dan O'Hanlon, Greg Shahadi, John Jernigan, and Todd Bryant. And I also want to thank all of my Patreon and PayPal perpetual partners. Here comes the list. You guys ready? Here we go. Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Benjamin Handelman, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, I am Carlos Perdoma of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood. Good job, Christophers. I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas, Daniel Nairler, Daniel Schaefer. Good job, Daniels. Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith. I am Elect Donnie Ariel Esquire, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Ogar of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Willem, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fartentain, John Hartman, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Namsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovrutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Passi, Martin Habich, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the mysterious Moon Master 9000, Mr. Michael Shahadi, Nate Salon, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek of DiplomatChess.com, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, The Law Office of Stuart Katz, WGM Tatia Babrahamian, Thomas Casper, Thomas Stanek, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com. His book is coming accessible. Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrinkouche, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thank you, everyone, and I will catch you all next week. Mm-hmm.